And if you walk round the side of the memorial, it takes you to the cairn. To the brawl. We're at Inver Caravan Park and B&B on the north east coast. It's the 16th of October now, so it's not nearly as busy as it would have been just a few months ago. The facilities here are very good, very clean and well maintained. There's a small amount of building work going on during the day when most people are out. Speaking of which, that's exactly what we're about to do. And that was the morning routine. It's what we have to go through every day when we're going out for a trip. It's not too bad, you get used to it. We've come out today to see Nibster Broch, Keese Castle and a couple of memorial cairns. And it's not long until we reach the first one. John Nicholson was a local farmer, artist and historian who illustrated many archaeological sites in Caithness including Nibster Broch, which we're on our way to see. Festina Lente. Proceed quickly, but diligently. On the way, we've discovered a small pier that looks to be abandoned. This rusty old winch would have been operated manually, but it looks like it's not been used for many years. This small dry stone building would have given the fishermen some much needed shelter in winter or if they were caught out by the stormy weather at sea and had to return to shore. We decide to walk to the end of the pier and it feels quite safe, not slippy at all and Kira is quite happy to walk along beside us. She's as curious as we are. As we walk along, we notice that there's lots of cracks where the raw materials, local pebbles, are exposed. And these cast iron mooring rings have certainly seen better days. At the end of the pier, these steps where the fishermen would have got in and out of their small boats. We're going to see a lot more of these later, but it's time to move on. There's some dramatic coastal scenery on the way to the Broch, and I'm lagging behind a bit, just taking in these views. I can see that Trish and Kira have found Nibster Broch, but it's the large memorial tower that I'm heading towards. The tower was originally built in the middle of the Broch site itself and was moved to its present location in 1987 as part of a job creation scheme. I'm surprised to see steps here, quite narrow, but I can get up. Mervyn's tower was built by John Nicholson, whose memorial we passed earlier. And you can walk right round. Mervyn was the nephew of Sir Francis Tress Barry, the archaeologist who first excavated Nibster Broch in the late 19th century. The tower was built using stones from the excavated Broch and incorporates a few rather strange gargoyles.
Did you make it up the stairs? Yeah. We were you made it up as well. We were on the bra. Oh. Yeah. Yay, she's down. <laughs> and as you come round the side of the memorial, it takes you down to the broch. It's very overgrown. Yep, it sure is overgrown. That's the memorial in the background and the broch just here. There's an entrance over there, look. It's extremely overgrown. So, thistles. Actually, it's nettles, stinging nettles. Get these out of the way. That's a thistle. And if I can squeeze past that, it just takes us to the inside. A little standing stone here. And that's the walls, the circular walls of the inside of this broch. Nibster broch dates back to the Iron Age and some of the scattered ruins are thought to be earlier Pictish buildings dating back to as far as 700 BC. There would have been lots of these structures and an entire community lived here with lots of these interlinked stone buildings all connected by a series of passages. All right, will we move on? Okay, is this the way? Over the fence, is it? Yes, no, it's not over the fence. You have to go to that plank of wood. Cross that plank of wood and see this sort of indentation on the path. Follow it round the rough area, all the way round. Um, and with Kira, I don't want to take a chance with that. It looks a bit dodgy to me. Well, someone said it was a tight on the cliff, so... Tight on the cliff? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's have a look. Yeah, that looks quite slippery. And you basically, you're having to walk all the way around that cliff face and away around the coast to get to the castle. So I'm afraid, on this occasion, it's had us beat. There's another castle just up the coast. Bacoli Castle, I think it's called. And that's where we're going now. Well, we didn't get to Old Keese Castle, but we did at least get these shots from the main road before we moved on. There's another castle down here, down this muddy trail. It's called Bacoli Castle. Trish is way back in the van, way, way back up the road. Wasn't going to chance taking the van down this road and there's not really much places to park. Oh, it is so, so boggy. The castle ruins, I think, are going to be worth coming all this way. Bacoli Castle. You just pass the ruins of this old croft house on the way. That in itself is quite impressive. Could probably tell a tale or two. But I do believe the castle is further down on the coast and I can't quite see it yet. I've spotted it. It's just coming into view now. Very boggy underfoot. Not sure if I should have came this way at all. Barbed wire fence. Yeah. But there is a trail. Oh. There is a trail. So people are coming this way. Which means I'm not the only idiot. Not the only sucker for a castle. Here it is, and I uh, have to say there's not much of it left, but what is there? It's very picturesque, it looks terrific. Standing there, precariously perched on the edge of that cliff, just looks like the sea is going to be reclaiming that pretty soon, so I'll not be getting too close. Bukoli Castle was first called Lambaburg, and was built around 1140, by Sven Aslifsson, notoriously known as the ultimate Viking from Orkney, due to his frequent raids on the west of Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Later in its history, the fortress was granted to the Mowat family by Robert the Bruce, 
and it remained in their family until 1661, after which time it was abandoned. After the castle, we headed back to the campsite to settle in for the night. There was just about time for Kira to have some playtime with her favourite toy, Ducky. You got a ducky? Have you got a ducky? <laughs> We've come out today to the grey cairns of Castor. You have to walk right across this peaty, boggy area and there's a thin bridge taking you across. The cairns we're going to see are about 5,000 years old. It would have been a completely different environment back then. This would not have been such a boggy landscape like this. It would have been a lot more dry. It would have been warmer back then too. And believe it or not, it would have been wetter. <laughs> Hard to believe. And we're just coming up to the first cairn. This one is known as the Round Cairn. And you can see an illustration there of what it might have looked back 5,000 years ago, back in the day. So these were effectively burial mounds. They were circular, most of them, in design. And they would come and put their dead in here, come here to worship them and remember them. Now, unfortunately, we can't get inside these cairns because of COVID. Um the cairns have been closed up and you can't get in. So that's a bit of a pity, but we can have, have at least have a little bit of a walk around the outside. So I suppose you had to crawl down on all fours to get into these things. You know, unless you are a hobbit or something like that. And just walking around it, you can see what it looks like big pile of stones and of course the inside of the chamber itself would have proper walls all the way around there's Trish heading back We're moving on to the next cairn which actually looks like it's bigger than this one this next cairn is a bit more impressive it's about 60 metres long and 20 metres wide. It looks like a row of terraced houses, but obviously for the dead. It's thought that local communities would have gathered together at these cairns to connect with the spirits of their ancestors whose remains were inside. This is the view from the very far side of the cairn. It just puts it into perspective a bit, doesn't it? Shows you exactly how long 60 metres is when you see it like that. Right, onward! We want to see a lot of things today. And next on the list, it's the Hill of Many Stains. Ooh. We're here at the Hill of Many Stains. Told you we were here. And the walk through this gate. Trish is up ahead of me as usual. Will take us up to those very many stains. Now stains of course is just a Scottish word meaning stones. So it's Hill of Many Stones. And apparently there are 22 rows of stones. They're a bit of a mystery here in Caithness because they don't really know what they were for. There's a wee picture here. They look like gravestones, don't they? But they're not apparently. Some people think that they might have been placed to line up with um, certain lunar or solar eclipses or um, things like that, but to me, it just looks like a random collection of 
stones or stoners. Stoners, as we say in Scotland. Something that stands up, a stoner. There's local folklore about these stones. Apparently a farmer took one of these stones to build a kiln at his farm. He later returned the stone because it burst into flames. Was it the devil at work? You tell me. Good one, Trish. So this little trail just takes us round the field of many stains. And then we'll head back to the van and move on. In Caithness, there's just so much ancient history to see. It's everywhere you go around this part of Scotland. There's brochs, there's cairns, there's castles. It's impossible to see it all. But we're having a fair old go, I have to say. Where next? Care no get. Care no get. All right. Let's get this one. No. And here is the Cairn of Get. It's literally just seven minutes up the road from the Hill of Many Stains. So we're just going to go through these gates, follow this little trail, and that'll take us there. Come on, Kira. Here you come. Kira. She doesn't like these gates. Come on. Three you come. Come on. Come on. Three you come. There you go. The pathway here is extremely boggy. Now, the sign said to follow the black poles. So, I can see some black poles leading up on the hill there. This is going to be further than we thought. Because these marker poles are going way off into the distance. Way down there. You up for it? No. Too far? Yeah. You sure? Yeah, I've brought my jacket or anything. I bet you it's that thing away up there. But how's your knee? It'll be that up there, look. No, that's not it. No, it's over there. You need to follow the poles. Do you want me to go on my own? You think you'll manage? I'll manage, it's like... No, oh, I don't want to soldier on for a bit. Excuse me, ladies, does anyone know the way to the Cairns of Get? Any idea? Do you know? No? Thankfully, they've put a boardwalk in on this section because it's extremely boggy. Oh, there's a little, little stone box sunk down here. Maybe it was a little grave or something, but that's a sign that we're coming up to something. Surely this is it. So that's what it would have looked like 5,000 years ago, back in the Neolithic period. Let's see what it looks like now. One way system. What do you think? It's a cairn. It's a cairn. It is. Ooh. Quite small. Well, ferns around. Yeah, I like it. I suppose it's been reconstructed partially. Um, to make it look the way it would have been. But I would imagine some of these larger stones would certainly have stayed in place and they maybe just had to build the dike up a little bit. So it looks like there's this outer section here and then a larger inner section. All right, Kira, what do you think of it? Hmm? Kira, what do you think of it? One last look before we go from above. There you go, the Cairn of Get. Ah, we're fairly getting through these sites today. I think next up, we actually may have kept the very best one till last. Fingers crossed. We're at the car park now for the Castle Sinclair 
in this little village called Gernigo. And that's uh, chucking it down outside. So we're sitting here in the car park at the moment and we're just thinking, well, what do we do? Do we go for it or do we wait it out till the rain goes off? What's the decision? Don't know. Well, I think we wait it out. There's just time for a quick soup and a munch. That's your lunch. And then we get a change in the weather. And the sun's out. Let's go before it changes its mind. On the way, we get this view of the Noss Head Lighthouse. As I swing the camera around, I get this view of Castle Sinclair here at Gringo. It's just five miles up the coast from Wick. The information board shows how it would have looked back in the day. A defensive stronghold and a working community under the leadership of the Sinclairs. Castle Sinclair was built over a 200 year period from around 1470 by the Sinclair Earls of Caithness, one of Scotland's most powerful families at the time. At the time of the Civil War, back in 1651, the castle was seized by Oliver Cromwell's troops and was their major stronghold in the north for nine years. Future generations of Sinclairs continued to build the castle during the 15th to 17th centuries. As you can see, the castle is now in a derelict state, but the Clan Sinclair Trust is undertaking restoration so that the remaining structure can be maintained for all to see for many years to come. We walk down the grassy slope and it takes us down to a little cove where they would have set sail in small boats for fishing. All around people have been stacking pebbles and they're absolutely everywhere. On this side the pebble stacks are really well displayed on these rock ledges. And of course, we have to do our bit, don't we? Sinclair Castle was fantastic, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very, very good. To me, that was the highlight for today. I just, yeah. I, mean, I can't believe we crammed so much in. A lot. I'm very tired now. Need a nap. Yeah. <laughs> I need a glass of wine. So let's head back to the campsite. That's it for this vlog. We'll see you on the next one, folks. Bye. Ta-da.